This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Well, welcome to you all. Um, my name is Graham Davies. I have the pleasure of being the chairman of the New Zealand UK Link Foundation. It's a very interesting body. Um, it was actually set up in 1991, um, for those of you who know a little New Zealand history, um, to celebrate. It was started in 1990 and really got into action in 91 to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Treaty of Waitangi. And quite a lot of funding was raised and a trust was set up with the intention of fostering intellectual, educational, vocational and academic links between this country and New Zealand. Um, we have a small group of trustees um, who take things forward and about three years ago we came up with the idea we were looking for doing things which were more than just shifting people around. It was to try and find a way of creating what we have called legacy. So that if you invest money, there's a dialogue that is established, but it's a dialogue that, that builds on often existing roots or creates new ones. So that after the visiting professorship, which we put together, um, has been pursued, something goes on afterwards. A good example was, um, unexpectedly, one of our visiting professors a year or two ago was a marine biologist. And you might think, well, that's sort of interesting, I suppose. But he was a specialist in marine preservation areas and built very strong links with DEFRA and with the Scottish um, Assembly, all of whom are, of course, interested in issues about marine protection. So, and as a consequence, there have been strong links. And all of the visiting professors to date, and we've only had three so far, um, apart from our fourth, which is here, um, have built legacy, and I have no doubt, building upon the connections that he already has, and the um, discussions he'll have while he is here, that Arthur Grimes will also create a legacy for us. Some of you may know of him. Um, he is an adjunct professor of economics at the University of Auckland, but very particularly, he was the first, I think, it, is it fair to say, the first external chairman of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, a post which you can see from whom he held for 10 years and which he stepped down from last week. Yes. <laughs> um, so we are deeply honored to have him and also, um, Charlie, could I thank you and the Bank of England for hosting this first lecture? It's a very iconic place to have a lecture of this sort. Um, I think that's enough for me. Um, and now I can um, introduce Arthur, who will start. And then when we get through his presentation, um, Charlie will chair a discussion, question and answer session as you explore some of the issues that Arthur puts on the table for us. Thanks very much. Well, thanks, Sir Graham, and it's great to be here, Charlie. Thanks for, for hosting this. Uh, it's certainly a great pleasure for me to be able to present this lecture in, in London, uh, which is the city that I did my graduate studies in. Uh, it's the first of four lectures on central banking topics that I'll be presenting uh, here in, in London. Uh, my connections with the Bank of England go back a, a fair way. Uh, Sir Mervyn King uh, taught me at LSE. Charlie was a teacher at LSE at the same time, and Charles Goodhart is here today. Of course, has a long connection with uh, the Bank of England and also uh, taught me much, both before I went to the LSE, during the LSE, and afterwards as well. In this lecture, I wish to deal with the performance of inflation targeting. Uh, subsequent lectures will deal with exchange rate systems, macroprudential policies, and microprudential policies. The lectures have been informed by 26 years' experience as a central banker over two separate periods. Uh, firstly, I was on the staff of the bank from 1979 for 15 years, uh, which was a time when we uh, drew up the idea of inflation targeting and changed the uh, Reserve Bank of New Zealand Act. 
And then I had a period of 10 years out, and then for the last 11 years I've been a director and then chair of the board of the Reserve Bank. Uh, I say, as Sir Graham said, I finished my term on the board last week, uh, so I'm speaking, I'm speaking purely in a private capacity and none of, the, uh, none of what I say should be attributed to the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Inflation targeting is a hot topic in monetary economics after the onset of the global financial crisis. Some have blamed it for creating the GFC. Geoffrey Frankel of Harvard University has recently, quote, regretfully announced its death. However, the death notice is premature. In fact, inflation targeting lives, and as I hope to demonstrate, remains a well-functioning system to guide central banks. But inflation targeting and monetary policy in general should not be expected to achieve too much. Today I'll first set out the background to the adoption of inflation targeting, considering the key intellectual underpinnings of the regime. These are worth recalling when comparing inflation targeting to other mooted alternatives, such as nominal GDP targeting. I demonstrate that the latter would perform poorly in some real-world circumstances. I'll then develop the theme that the time consistency arguments, which were at the crux of the establishment of inflation targeting, remain of central importance to policymaking. Indeed, problems of time inconsistency have, I contend, been at the heart of the GFC. I'll also provide some brief statistical tests of the efficacy of inflation targeting prior to offering some brief conclusions. So first, some background. After approximately two years of de facto inflation targeting, the first formal inflation target was signed in February 1990 in New Zealand between the Governor of the Reserve Bank and the Minister of Finance. It was part of the first policy targets agreement following the change in the Act, uh, and that Act stated the primary function of the bank is to formulate and implement monetary policy directed to the economic objective of achieving and maintaining stability in the general level of prices. The Act gave the bank's Governor the independence to choose and to set monetary policy instruments to achieve the agreed inflation target. Thus, the bank was granted instrument independence, but not target independence. Ultimately, the target was set by the, by the politicians subject to the Act. Price stability, which was then defined as CPI inflation within 0 to 2 per cent, was achieved in 1991, actually a year ahead of the initial target. Annual inflation had fallen from an average rate of 11.7 per cent over the previous two decades, so you can see in the graph there the highly variable and average high rate of inflation from 1970 through to 1990, and the low average rate and less volatility since then. It was New Zealand's high and extremely variable inflation rate over that two-decade period to 1990 that caused a rethink of monetary policy. The previous Act contained multiple targets for monetary policy and required uh, the, mon the monetary policy be directed, quote, to the maintenance and promotion of economic and social welfare in New Zealand, having regard to the desirability of promoting the highest degree of production, trade and employment, and of maintaining a stable internal price level. A whole gamut of uh, objectives for one single policy. New Zealand had not only experienced high and volatile inflation since the 1960s, it also had uh, experienced poor average growth rates. In fact, we'd fallen from third richest country in the OECD in 1960 to 17th highest in 1985 out of 24 countries. Uh, and by 1984, uh, the fiscal deficit and the balance of payments deficit were both over 6% of GDP. So clearly the loose monetary policy of the 20 years uh, preceding 1990 had just not bought any kind of degree of uh, economic uh, prosperity. While the economic background was dire, how did the move to adopt a formal inflation target arise? Remember, this was a very novel thing back when we, when we dreamt it up. Well, the political backdrop was a foreign exchange crisis in 1984 following a, following, a, following a change in government. But the intellectual backdrop went back a lot further. Uh, it comprised four strands, each of which I believe remains relevant today. The first strand was, was uh, Milton, Th Milton Friedman's monetarism. Uh, a key tenet of that was accepted, specifically that in the long run, Monetary policy affects the price level, but not real variables. Thus, unlike many former policymakers, a crude form of the Phillips curve was rejected. And that's despite Bill Phillips, of course, being a New Zealander. May not be known here, but he is. He was. 
Um, policymakers didn't reject the possibility of a short-run trade-off between inflation and real activity, but there was scepticism that such a trade-off could be exploited consistently to achieve short-run real economy ends. And in addition, Tim Bergen's assignment principle suggested that monetary policy should be assigned to the objective which it was most capable of achieving, which was reducing inflation. Other policy instruments should be uh, directed to other, uh, other targets, such as full employment, etc. So this laid the basis for targeting a nominal variable as the focus for monetary policy. Second, while long-run monetarist results were, were accepted, there was a fundamental disagreement with a monetarist prescription favouring monetary rules over discretion, and particularly a money supply growth rule. We considered the relationships between monetary aggregates and nominal variables to be highly unstable. This instability was being magnified by the financial innovation of the time and also with uh, disintermediation followed by reintermediation as uh, various regulations changed. Thus, it was considered that policymakers needed to retain the ability to reconfigure monetary settings to account for shifting economic relationships. This laid the basis for the Reserve Bank retaining discretion. Uh, i.e. instrument <coughs> independence in relation to the choice of monetary instruments and the settings of that monetary instrument. And it's worth recalling here that the Reserve Bank of New Zealand actually used a form of money base operating target as its instrument when inflation targeting was first adopted. It only moved to setting an interest rate nine years after inflation targeting was first introduced. Thus a simplistic characterisation, which I've seen in, in a number of places, that inflation targeting goes hand in hand with a single interest rate instrument is simply incorrect. A multiplicity of monetary policy tools could, could conceivably be used in implementing uh, inflation targeting at all times and not just at times of when the zero lower bound has been reached. Third, a lively literature emerged in the late 1970s advocating nominal GDP targeting or NGDP targeting, either of NGDP growth rates or of the NGDP level relative to a trend growth path. And of course, Charlie Bean did his PhD on that in the, in around that time. Advocacy of an NGDP target followed dissatisfaction with the outcomes arising from targeting real activity and inflation separately and achieving neither. Um, well, at least nominal GDP targeting was consistent with our first strand of thinking, that monetary policy should target a nominal variable. But three factors counted against it, and still do. The first was that GDP statistics are released considerably later than is the CPI, so the central bank would inevitably have to rely on outdated readings for the variable that it would be targeting. Furthermore, GDP data can be and is revised materially, and that would really complicate monetary policy setting. The second factor was that nominal GDP growth, at least in a commodity producing country such as New Zealand, is highly volatile. This figure shows the year-on-year -year growth rate at quarterly rests for nominal GDP in blue, which is the only one you really have to concentrate on, also real GDP uh, shown in red, the CPI inflation shown in green, and the underlying CPI, the sort of purely dotted line. The volatility in nominal GDP, that's the blue line, makes it impractical to target the NGDP growth rate. For instance, in 1992, year-on-year -year NGDP growth is 4.7%, perhaps fairly comfortable. It then fell to 0% almost immediately, and very shortly after that it jumped to 10.5%. So 4.7%, 0%, 10%. Furthermore, while nominal and real GDP generally move together, there are times when they move in different directions, and the recession of 2000 and 2001 was a time uh, when nominal GDP growth was comfortable, 5 to 8%, but the economy was actually in recession. A nominal GDP targeting central bank would not have cut rates in such circumstances, i.e. during a recession, uh, when it should have done. Now, an NGDP levels target relative to trend <coughs> would also have faced problems, and this is the, uh, the target that more people are talking about uh, today. And one of the reasons why it would face problems is that each of real GDP and, GDP and the GDP deflator, the price level, is a, what's called a non-stationary variable in statistical terms, which means that there are permanent shocks to their level. Real GDP in particular is likely to be non-stationary or have permanent shocks under any monetary regime. Just think of all the changes in productivity or um, oil shocks or all sorts of other things that happen that have a pretty permanent effect on GDP. Rather than letting bygones be bygones, as a growth target does, a levels target forces the monetary authority to offset a permanent upward or downward shock. 
A levels target would force a supply-driven upward shock to prices, such as an oil shock, to be reflected either as a subsequent downward movement in real activity to offset, offset the upward shock in nominal GDP, or as a subsequent downward movement in prices, which itself is likely to cause a recession if you had to tighten monetary policy sufficiently to offset an oil price shock. For example, assume that in 1973, New Zealand had adopted a nominal GDP levels target of the kind that's being, being talked about now. So it's a target relative to trend. And let the trend be given by the previous 10 years growth rate in nominal GDP, which was actually 10% per annum. So we're allowing nominal GDP, the target nominal GDP, to grow at 10% per annum through this period. From, uh, we can, so it's growing at that from its 1973 base. Well, this figure plots the nominal GDP gap calculated as the percentage difference in actual nominal GDP from target nominal GDP for each of 1974 on the left of the graph to 1980 on the right. <coughs> as you can see, the gap was approximately zero in 1974. So it comes down to the, on the horizontal axis to zero. So there was no gap in the nominal GDP target at that rate. But over the next six years, it grew to reach 31% by 1980. In other words, nominal GDP was 31% above its trend growth rate by 1980. A nominal GDP targeting central bank would have had to have cut, um, had to have tightened monetary policy massively during this period of the two oil shocks. And that's despite the target itself growing at 10% per annum. However, following 1974, real GDP growth actually averaged negative 0.8% per annum over the next six years. So what we would have seen is a nominal GDP targeting central bank would have been tightening policy massively to get rid of this nominal GDP gap at a time when New Zealand was in recession for six years. Now, I'm not sure how many advocates of nominal GDP levels targeting uh, would actually argue that that's a good idea. And yet that's an absolute example of the, of the um, difficulty that a nominal GDP target would have. The third factor that counted against nominal GDP targeting is that there's no part of society that cares about nominal GDP. Okay, real GDP is important for real incomes, Inflation is important for uh, market signalling and for equity reasons, but nominal GDP is simply unimportant in its own right. Furthermore, if an event such as a drought, which is a temporary supply shock, hits production, the implication, so we get an, a decline in, in activity because of the drought, the implication of a nominal GDP target in that case would be that the central bank would loosen monetary policy so as to achieve higher inflation. So nominal GDP has come down because of the drought, um, we want to target nominal GDP, keep it up, so we'd have high inflation. Not only would real GDP fall, but we'd have high inflation at the same time, so we wouldn't meet either of the objectives that we might be interested in, uh, which clearly is, it just doesn't make much sense at all. Flexible inflation targeting takes such shocks into account uh, because it's an inflation target, not a price level target. <coughs> a flexibly applied NGDP levels target would be a thoroughly non-credible regime since the raison d'etre of the regime is to restore the path of nominal GDP to some long-run target level when the long-run target path with, without that having been altered by short-run events. So I don't believe it's possible to run a nominal GDP levels target in a flexible way in the way that flexible inflation targeting can be run. This doesn't mean that nominal GDP is, is irrelevant for monetary policy makers. It actually turns out to be a very useful uh, indicator, uh, one of a number of indicators for a monetary policy maker. Um, in, this, in this slide, I've, uh, for people who are used to vector order regression models, I'll recognise this immediately as a cumulative impulse response function. For those that don't, don't worry. Um, this is, uh, what this is is a picture of the reaction of the CPI, the blue line, uh, to a shock to nominal GDP on average over in, in New Zealand over, over history. And what we see is that if there's a shock to nominal GDP in quarter one, there's almost no change to the CPI initially, but over quarters two to six, there's a rise in the CPI uh, over the following, uh, following, over those four quarters, which then levels out. So it turns out that nominal GDP is quite a useful indicator, along with many other indicators for a monetary policymaker. It's just not sensible as a target. Okay. The fourth and fundamentally important strand of thinking that led me to the introduction of inflation targeting, coupled with instrument independence, was the literature on time and consistency. Uh, I'd actually just come back from LSE. Uh, I'd had people like Charlie and Chris Pisarides and, uh, and Charles uh, teaching 
the literature on time and consistency was very influential uh, for me. Now, the fundamental insight of the time and consistency literature was that if government had an interest in both real GDP and inflation, then adoption of a discretionary monetary policy by the government would either harm the level of real GDP or raise the inflation rate, or both. The literature of the time argued that the only way to get around this was to follow a monetary rule, a money supply growth rule, like, like Friedman. Um, but we'd already ruled that out as being uh, problematic in a time of high um, financial innovation. Now, it's just worth recalling the basic time inconsistency logic here, because I believe it remains highly relevant for policy, and I'll return to it later in the lecture. The idea is that government cares about both inflation rate and unemployment relative to the natural rate of unemployment. The unemployment rate is determined by the inflation rate less expected inflation. And government is used, expected to use monetary policy to target the inflation rate, or to set the inflation rate. Now, if government had perfect credibility, there would be no problems. The government would set inflation at zero, inflation expectations would be in accordance with that also at zero, uh, there would be no difference between the two, and unemployment would be at the natural rate. But governments, as we know, cheat. And uh, they, uh, knowing that inflation expectations are going to be zero, they'll actually buy lower unemployment by setting in the inflation rate higher. So they'll end up with a higher inflation rate, um, but obviously people are, aren't stupid, they expect this to happen, and so inflation expectations turn out to be higher as well. So we get higher inflation expectations, higher inflation, the government gains nothing in terms of reducing unemployment, so we're left with a situation where we have high inflation but no benefits on the unemployment front. Now, of course, the government could be hard-nosed and choose not to cheat. Uh, it could decide to set inflation at zero. But agents know that it's got the incentive to cheat, and so they still set their inflation expectations high. And in this situation, if the government doesn't cheat, then we're in the worst, worst of all possible worlds. Uh, inflation might be zero, but unemployment is high, because people are expecting inflation to occur. Um, now, this makes a zero inflation policy under these circumstances not credible. A government just can't stick to a policy of zero inflation because, in the end, uh, it'll have to wear the high unemployment um, that that would bring. So how do we break through this Gordian knot? Well, it was then the apparent novel recognition uh, at the time that government could itself retain uh, preferences over both inflation and unemployment. It could care about both of those things, but it could instruct an independent central bank to achieve only an inflation target. The central bank will then optimally choose and commit to zero inflation, because that's what it's been told to do, and that's all it's been told to do. There's no incentive on the central bank to cheat, because it doesn't care about unemployment, it doesn't care about the growth rate. And because of that, it can cement in low, in low inflation expectations, and with those low inflation expectations, they're, met, they're equal to, this, to the inflation rate, there is no um, resulting unemployment. The outcome, therefore, is unemployment at its natural rate and zero inflation. That one. This, this box here just summarises uh, that. So in a non-credible regime, one where the government sets the policy and cares about both inflation uh, and unemployment, we see that a, a positive sign just indicates that it's above zero. Um, not, not, it's not beneficial necessarily, it's just above zero. So a non-credible inflation, uh, non-credible policy, but the government reneges, it, it sets higher inflation. We have the inflation rate and the expected inflation positive. The unemployment rate, uh, the difference between that and the natural rate, zero. Uh, but there's a cost overall because of the high inflation. If the government chooses not to renege, it can set inflation at zero, but it ends up with high unemployment and it gets an even worse cost uh, to it. And the only way to get around that there is the credible inflation targeting regime where an independent central bank targets inflation and doesn't care about anything else. So the implication of this analysis is that the central bank should be held directly accountable for targeting inflation and only inflation. Now, the separation of objectives could be achieved through a number of ways. It could be achieved by providing a monetary incentive on the bank's governor to achieve a specified inflation rate. This was an idea that Charles Goodhart actually mooted and was never, was never followed through, despite the fact that the world's press kept on describing that that was the actual regime in New Zealand for about five years after we adopted the regime, which was a little bit disconcerting, but Charles is obviously very influential. Um, Alternatively, it could be achieved by specifying, as we did in the central bank's legislation, that the bank's primary duty was to maintain price stability and not mention any other targets in the, in the Act. And that's what we did. 
Transparency and accountability was bolstered by making a single individual, the governor, responsible for the conduct of monetary policy. Now, the governor is subject to formal oversight, but not control, by the bank's board of directors, which I've just retired from, and is subject to informal oversight, of course, by the markets and the media. These arrangements enable the governor both to implement current monetary policy decisions and, importantly, to provide forward guidance on future monetary policy decisions that does not have to be tempered by a committee consensus. And it's worth pointing out here that forward guidance started in New Zealand in 1997 and has been given in every quarter since then. Um, it's nothing new, it's nothing um, radical. Uh, forward guidance is what our analysts expect the Reserve Bank to provide them with, and it provides forward guidance on interest rates for the next two years and has done, as I say, since 1997. Now, there are some fish hooks, unfortunately. Uh, four fish hooks remained. <clears throat> the first one was defining price stability. And here, uh, for all those who have you know, studied monetary economics and macroeconomics know that most macroeconomic models have one price for, uh, in, in the model, and it's called P. Now, that doesn't really help you very much when you're, when you're trying to say, what should we target? Well, we ended up targeting the CPI, the Consumer's Price Index, for a number of reasons. Uh, it's calculated by the official statistical agency. It's never revised. It's the, uh, it's the price that's used most often for <laughs> contracts and in bargaining. And ultimately, it relates to the end goal of, of consumers, it's consumption. Now, none of these arguments was entirely convincing by itself. Uh, but because it was the most publicly visible uh, price index, we decided that, that had to be the one that we would target. But even from the very first policy targets agreement in 1990, there was an explicit requirement on the Reserve Bank to, to monitor a range of price indices. Uh, and that included the potential to monitor asset price indexes as well as goods market price indexes. So that was explicitly in there to monitor a range of prices, um, and that has been, as I say, there since 1990. The second fish hook is whether to adopt an inflation target or a price level target. Now, despite a common perception, most central bankers still have a Keynesian streak back there, a long way, long way back in the consciousness. The consensus within the bank was that deliberately engineering negative inflation following a positive inflation shock uh, would create significant and long-lasting unemployment. Thus, an inflation target, which lets bygones be bygones, was favoured over a price level target. And as I said before, it also is favoured over a nominal GDP target. It was acknowledged that the inflation target gave less long-term certainty over prices than a price-level target would, but we were prepared to trade off that uncertainty for, um, to get away from this situation where we'd have to engineer negative inflation at times. The third fish hook was whether to uh, have a, a points target or, an or a range target. And just briefly there, we chose a 0 to 2% target. The 0% was uh, driven by the same rationale as I've just talked about. We didn't want to have to have negative inflation. Um, and we had a narrow target of 0 to 2% because we were still trying to cement in credibility from two decades of very high inflation. Gradually over time, as we've uh, established our credibility, uh, we've managed to loosen that target. And in fact, now it's 1% to 3% on average over the medium term. It's not every year. Um, now, since 1990, there's uh, one worrying uh, aspect, I think, is that we have to be able to maintain credibility. Now, since 1990, the target range has slipped from 0 to 2 per cent, then to 0 to 3 per cent, then to 1 to 3 per cent. And I believe this slippage reflects an, a lingering view in the polity that there is a long-run trade-off between inflation and real sector outcomes. So gradually, we've slipped from a 1 per cent midpoint to a 1.5 per cent midpoint to a 2 per cent midpoint. Uh, I believe that further slippage would place the regime uh, in some, some doubt. Fourthly, the adoption of an initial narrow range led to a recognition that inflation would sometimes stray outside the range, and in some cases it would actually be desirable for it to do so. <coughs> so this led to the need to uh, specify certain caveats around the inflation target when the central bank would not be expected to hit its target range. <coughs> But we wanted to keep these caveats limited so that we wouldn't lose credibility. Obviously, after two decades of high inflation, if we had all sorts of outs for the central bank, no one would believe that we meant what we said. So aside from measurement issues, the bank was not expected to meet its target in the face of material changes in indirect taxes or government charges uh, or major supply shocks. And in fact, we explicitly included in the latter uh, major terms of trade changes and natural or other disasters. <coughs> 
uh, and we've had each of those, very unfortunately, the natural disasters in, in New Zealand have been uh, major in the last few years. Each of these shocks refer to a situation in which prices initially rise as a result of a supply shock, not a demand shock. The bank was expected to accommodate the first round um, of these shocks, but not to accommodate any second round effects. <clears throat> the adoption of a range for the target inflation rate with a set of caveats surrounding government taxation and supply shocks meant that the inflation targeting regime from the outset was one of flexible inflation targeting, using Lars Svensson's terminology. But importantly, the flexibility was designed to accommodate supply shocks only, not demand shocks. Now, at this point, I wish to uh, return to time and consistency. <clears throat> Since the onset of the GFC, some commentators and scholars have questioned the suitability of inflation targeting as a monetary policy regime. I believe these commentators overlooked the importance of the time consistency arguments. Indeed, in my view, this argument is at the heart of the problems that the global economy has faced in recent years. The simple setup of the time consistency problem that I described above posits that unemployment is a function of mismet inflation expectations. It doesn't specify the mechanism by which that has to occur. For those who are, who are macroeconomic scholars, it doesn't necessarily mean that the original Lucas specification holds. Consider instead an economy in which agents believe that future asset prices could be at one of two levels. A star, which is the asset price based on fundamentals and the currently announced monetary policy. Or the, price, um, or, um, the future asset price could be A+, plus, which essentially is just a higher asset price based on a belief that a central bank will be accommodative in the future. A+, plus is therefore not based on currently announced monetary policy, but would be justified based on a deviation from current monetary policy that accommodates higher asset price expectations. Now, if all other investors believe that future asset prices will be A star, then it will be optimal for any single investor to also act as if A star will be the future price and invest accordingly. However, if a sufficient number of investors believe that the future asset price will be A plus, the higher level of asset prices, each investor will have to decide whether the central bank will, will accommodate A plus or not. Um, and uh, if you believe it won't accommodate it, you'll drop out of the market, clearly because the asset prices are higher than what you think they should be. So the only people left in the market will be those believing that asset prices will be accommodated in the future. The result is that at some tipping point, the investors that remain in the asset market are those that believe that A-plus will in future be accommodated. Their leverage and other decisions will be made accordingly, and lenders will have to go through the same uh, calculation as well. If they believe that the central bank in future will accommodate these higher asset prices, they will make their lending decisions accordingly. Now, the central bank in the future period faces the same difficult decisions as faced by the central bank in our original time and consistency problem. If investors have acted as if A plus will be accommodated, or future higher asset prices will be accommodated, the central bank can either validate these expectations ex post or not validate them. If it does not validate them, in other words, if it sticks to the monetary path that justifies only A star, the lower level of asset prices, assets will be worth less than expected, um, some leveraged uh, asset holders will go bankrupt, lenders will take a capital hit, may go bankrupt, and the standard credit channels will operate as we saw after the GFC. Alternatively, if the central bank does validate A+, then these higher asset prices will, be, will have been justified and there will be no bankruptcies, etc. The issue therefore comes down to whether or not a central bank can credibly pre-commit not to accommodate asset market excesses. A conservative central banker with an explicit inflation target, in the way that Rogoff in 1985 described it, or an inflation nutter, using Mervyn King's more colourful terminology from 1997, might be able to do so. However, a central bank that has a dual or a diffused mandate, or one that may realistically be subject to future political directive, will not be able to credibly pre-commit not to accommodate those asset prices, in which case a self-fulfilling asset bubble can ensue. And not only can it ensue, but it ensues rationally. In this respect, we cannot escape from the history of irrational exuberance in the United States during the 1980s, 1990s and 2000s. As is well known, Alan Greenspan in 1996 questioned whether asset markets investors were then displaying irrational exuberance. With the Fed having used accommodative monetary policy to avoid real sector fallout from the 1987 share crash, the Russian debt crisis and then the collapse of LTCM, 
Greenspan explained that the central bank role was to mop up after a bubble had burst, his words, mop up, not to prevent the bubble in the first place. Now, mopping up implies accommodating the exuberant asset price expectations, thereby validating them ex post. Knowing that this is the likely central bank reaction, the rational expectation of investors is for a high future value of assets, A+, plus, not the value based on existing fundamentals and a non-accommodative monetary stance. Now, I should stress here that I'm not being critical of Greenspan's stewardship. No central banker ever criticises another central banker, you should know that. He was acting under a mandate that effectively required the Federal Reserve to mop up the after-effects of a bubble. It was the diffused mandate, not the person, that was the problem. Current monetary policy in the United States and in some other countries can be characterised as accommodating the high asset price expectations prior to 2007, which were formed on the basis of the Federal Reserve's stated reaction function to mop up, as, as earlier stated. <coughs> Now, while goods market inflation is currently contained, the sell-off in asset prices, whenever the word tapering is mentioned, is an indication that the disequilibrium set up by the asset bubble has yet to be unwound. <coughs> Given the real-world complications faced by all policy regimes, the proof of the pudding for any regime is in the eating. Ultimately, you have to test regimes. So how well is inflation targeting, I might shorten that to IT, actually performed? Well, one way to assess this question is to analyse the performance of developed economies that have adopted inflation targeting relative to the performance of other advanced economies. To do so, I conduct a series of difference and difference statistical tests. Specifically, I examine the performance of each inflation targeting country relative to OECD average performance and compare this difference in performance between countries before and after the adoption of inflation targeting. Four economic outcomes are examined as shown in the table. And I'll concentrate on the GDP growth one uh, in, in this lecture. For each outcome, I report both the change in the country's average performance relative to the OECD and, more importantly, the change in the dynamics of economic adjustment following the adoption of inflation targeting. Now, a common criticism of inflation targeting is that by concentrating on keeping inflation near target, persistence in real sector variables increases, and so real cycles become extended both in length and amplitude. In fact, in 2007, Hetzel documented Federal Reserve members' opposition to the adoption of an inflation target on the grounds that volatility in real sector variables would increase. So accordingly, the key element of the test that I present here is where the persistence in real sector variables changes as a result of adopting inflation targeting. To avoid selection bias, I limit my attention to the countries that were within the first 24 OECD countries, the, developed, the original 24 developed countries, if you like. And I show the uh, countries there and their dates of, of inflation targeting adoption, starting with New Zealand in 1990 and going through to Iceland in 2001. I exclude the Euro countries as none of them individually has an inflation target, okay, clearly, um, by definition. Now, I provide the difference in different specification in a full set of results in an appendix to this lecture, which I'll ultimately put on, on the web. I test the hypothesis that adoption of inflation targeting has no effect on the persistence or the levels of real sector variables. Uh, the equations are estimated from 1972, following the breakdown of Bretton Woods through to the uh, end of 2012. Now, the results can be summarised as follows. <coughs> inflation targeting has not led to any systematic increase or decrease in the persistence of real variables. This is the case for each of the GDP growth rate, the change in employment, and the current account balance as a percentage of GDP. This figure graphs the persistence results for annual GDP growth. The blue bar for each country shows the pre-inflation targeting persistence coefficient. The higher it is, the more persistent is, is, the, uh, is GDP growth. Uh, and the little star um, uh, on the axis shows whether it's significantly different from zero or not. The second bar, the red bar, shows the post-inflation targeting uh, persistence coefficient. And any uh, um, star or, or uh, plus sign next to the country name indicates they're significantly different pre versus post inflation targeting. <coughs> two countries show a significant decrease in GDP persistence, two show a significant increase, and four countries show no significant difference. In other words, there's no systematic change in persistence across countries that have introduced inflation targeting. The next figure graphs the level parameters for annual GDP growth relative to the OECD. So this is your country's growth rate relative to the OECD growth rate. 
Again, there is no systematic evidence of any worsening in average performance for the GDP growth rate, or for, or for that matter, for any of the other real sector variables. Indeed, there is evidence that inflation targeting adoption is, an, is associated with an increase in the GDP growth rate, as well as the current account balance, which I'm not showing here. Six of the eight countries in this, in this graph show an increase in the relative annual GDP growth rate, three of which are significant, none show a significant decrease. Now, I must stress that these, these latter results are not necessarily causal. It could be that countries adopted inflation targeting at the same time they adopted other growth-enhancing policies or whatever. So I'm not making any causal claims here. Um, also, in, uh, wider results show that inflation became less persistent with the adoption of inflation targeting as we expected, and high inflation countries gravitated uh, down towards the, towards the mean. So the full set of results provides evidence that inflation targeting adoption at worst has done no harm to real sector outcomes, and on balance has been associated with a lift in GDP growth um, and a fall in inflation. Most importantly, there's no evidence that inflation targeting adoption has led to any increase in, increase in persistence. So just some final concluding comments. Inflation targeting was introduced first in New Zealand, a country that had experienced high inflation relative to other developed countries. It has since been introduced widely across developed and developing countries. The empirical evidence indicates that it has been successful in containing inflation and has been associated with improved average real economic performance with no systematic increase in persistence of real variables. Inflation targeting is not plagued by the instabilities that render monetary growth targets or nominal GDP growth targets impractical. Both systems were rejected in favour of inflation targeting. Furthermore, inflation targeting does not suffer from the problem of having to use monetary policy to offset the effects of permanent shocks to real GDP or the GDP deflator that would be devil nominal GDP levels targeting. To me, it's just a non-starter, that latter uh, regime. While these properties present advantages for inflation targeting over other candidate monetary regimes, a key advantageous property of inflation targeting is, in my view, its rejection of a dual mandate or a diffused mandate. Any central bank with a dual inflation real sector mandate is unable to commit to achieving price stability. Paradoxically, paradoxically, to those brought up with a naive Phillips curve view of the world, the ability to commit to low inflation leads to better real sector outcomes. This is the key insight of the time inconsistency literature. The issue is, however, <coughs> much deeper than envisaged in the original literature. A dual mandated central bank cannot commit to a policy that refuses to accommodate speculative asset booms. A considerable literature exists on the history of asset booms and busts over the centuries, and showing that many, though not all of these booms, are associated with monetary laxity. But monetary, lax monetary policy need not be lax ex ante to fuel an asset price boom. Provided that investors and lenders believe that a dual mandated monetary authority will act in accordance with the real leg of its dual mandate, it is quite possible for a self-fulfilling asset bubble to occur rationally, or a boom to occur rationally. It won't be a bubble, because it actually is rational. The dual mandated central bank has no option but to protect the real economy when asset prices have overreached prices based on prior fundamentals. The central bank must therefore expand liquidity so as to accommodate the higher asset prices. In these circumstances, the asset price boom is entirely rational. And arguably, this is a fair representation of Federal Reserve policy since at least the 1987 share crash. A single mandated inflation targeting central bank is less likely than a dual mandated institution to face the same pressure to accommodate an asset price boom. There is less rationale, therefore, for investors to believe that an asset price boom will be self-fulfilling. I say less likely, for in a fiat currency world, no mandate is irrevocable. Even the Reserve Bank of New Zealand Act contains a section whereby government can change the primary focus of the bank away from price stability. So it must do so transparently, and this has never been used since 1990. Inflation targeting is essentially an attempt to use a transparent target to discipline the government and the monetary authority to adhere to a long-term policy of moderate price stability. In so doing, it attempts to discipline private sector agents to act as if price stability will be maintained. The system can never achieve perfection. Well, there we go. Um, it can never achieve perfection, and as both Mark Carney and Charlie Bean have emphasised in speeches earlier this year, there is a real danger of expecting too much from monetary policy. I agree entirely with them on this point. Monetary policy should be focused transparently on achieving what it is best able to achieve. It is not a substitute for a range of other sensible economic policies. Nevertheless, the record of inflation targeting is strong, and there is no convincing reason to change it. Thank you.
It's now my pleasure to invite Charlie Bean, Deputy Governor of the Bank, to respond. Oh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be asked to comment on this uh, talk by Arthur Grimes on the New Zealand experience with inflation targeting. Uh, as Arthur noted at the outset of his talk, uh, our paths crossed uh, at LSE back in the late 1980s when Arthur was doing his PhD. Uh, in fact, before his talk, he pointed out to me we met even earlier than that. Uh, when I was uh, still working in the, the Treasury. So this is, puts us back in the late 1970s, I think. Uh, so we go a long way back. Um, anyway, since he finished at LSC, he's had a very distinguished career, uh, both inside and outside the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. So uh, as the football, football pundits would say here, the boy done well. Uh, well, Arthur cites four ingredients that played into the adoption of inflation targets. Uh, first, the appreciation that while there might be a short-run trade-off between inflation and activity, uh, in the long run, monetary policy could determine only the price level. Uh, second, a realization uh, born from bitter experience that an intermediate target, such as money supply, uh, provided an unreliable lodestar for monetary policy. Uh, third, that describing policy in terms of its ultimate objective made sense. And fourth, that assigning the conduct of monetary policy to an independent agency presented a solution to the time inconsistency problem. Well, the delegation of the opera operational responsibility for achieving the inflation target to an independent central <coughs> bank was a logical, consequ lo logical consequence of this. Uh, and I think it's worth stressing here that in all jurisdictions uh, where such an approach has been followed, inflation targets have been pursued in a flexible fashion uh, to avoid generating excessive short-run volatility in output, uh, despite the fact that the uh, mandate given to the uh, central bank might uh, elevate price stability ahead of other objectives. Uh, and while central banks are focused on achieving the inflation target as the medium-term goal, they've not been blind to the implications of activity uh, in deciding how quickly they seek to return inflation to target when it's moved away. Uh, well, Arthur spent the first part of his talk tonight discussing the choice of target, uh, the main other contender that he considered being a target for nominal GDP, uh, now, this is an old idea. It dates back to James Mead's 1977 Nobel Prize lecture. Um, probably somebody will tell me uh, it can be found even further back. Now that, if you look hard enough, it's probably in Adam Smith. Most things are. <laughs> um, anyway, I chose to focus part of my uh, own PhD thesis at MIT uh, on the topic a couple of years later, uh, exploring the operating properties of what today I guess would be called a strict nominal GDP target. Uh, and I showed that under uh, some circumstances, it generated good outcomes in the face of technology shocks, as well as aggregate demand shocks. Uh, however, as Arthur demonstrated, there's plenty of other shocks, for instance, oil price shocks, where nominal GDP targeting performs less well. Uh, so in practice, to avoid these consequences, if one adopted a nominal GDP target, it would need to be pursued flexibly. And since the same monetary policy instrument settings could then be achieved under both a flexible inflation targeting regime and a flexible nominal GDP targeting regime, the choice between them would then come down to other issues. Uh, well, a nominal GDP target has a couple of particular drawbacks, um, uh, which Arthur mentioned. The first is the data are less timely. Uh, than that for inflation, subject to revision, and that susceptibility to revision potentially makes it harder for the public to understand the central bank's objectives uh, and for it uh, also to be held to account. Uh, the second drawback uh, is that a nominal GDP target probably means less to the average person than an inflation target. 
Uh, now, I think one of the virtues of an inflation target is that it provides people with a simple heuristic for forming their expectations of how fast prices will rise, and that gets muddied if you have a target for nominal GDP growth. Uh, well, in his talk, Arthur explored some of the problems that might have arisen uh, if the Reserve Bank of New Zealand had been tasked with pursuing a target for the level rather than the growth of nominal GDP. Uh, and recently, on the back of work by Mike Woodford, there's been a renewed interest in such a target as a way to inject further stimulus into an uh, economy when interest rates have reached their zero lower bound. So you've had a big negative shock of the sort that we had during the crisis. Monetary policy has been relaxed by cutting interest rates uh, as far as you can go. Uh, well, the idea in Mike Woodford's analysis is quite simple. Uh, if nominal GDP falls a long way short of some predetermined trend level, then policy will have to be kept loose for a long time to get it back there. And in the sort of models with forward-looking agents that Mike Woodford uses, that involves not only holding the nominal interest rate at its zero bound for a long time, but also accepting sustained elevated inflation in the future as a way to reduce long-term real interest rates and thus to boost demand today. I think there's two problems with this proposal. So if you like, I'm giving you a compliment to um, Arthur's critique of the uh, uh, targeting the level of nominal GDP. Uh, first, it's not obviously credible to commit to keeping policy loose and inflation elevated uh, in the fashion required once the immediate urgent uh, emergency is passed. If excess inflation is bad, then whoever sets the target will have the incentive just to reset it. So you can't make it credible. Uh, second, I think it's extremely doubtful, anyway, that promising higher future inflation uh, is actually a very effective way to boost demand today in the way that's uh, built into the models. For instance, those of you who are old enough to be around in the 1970s uh, will remember that high inflation led to high, not low, savings uh, here in the UK. Okay, well, after considering implementation issues, such as the choice of price index, uh, and whether to target or a point or a range, Arthur moves on to the relationship between the monetary policy regime and financial stability issues. And this, of course, has been a hot topic in central banking circles in recent years. Ahead of the financial crisis, uh, Alan Greenspan and some of his colleagues argued that monetary policy could do little to prevent excessive financial exuberance, and the best that could be done was to clean up after any subsequent bust, hastening the return to expansion. Others, um, particularly Bill White and colleagues of his at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, argued that monetary policy should instead lean against such exuberance during the upswing of an asset price credit boom. And that could mean consciously undershooting an inflation target for a while in the near term. Now on the face of it, the experience of the past decade, which points to very large costs from a financial bust, strengthens, strengthens the hand of those who would rather lean than clean. Uh, although, as I argued at Jackson Hole a couple of years ago, macroprudential policies rather than higher interest rates probably ought to be the first line of defense against such financial excesses. Well, Arthur adds an interesting, uh, and I think novel, I can't recollect having seen it anywhere in the literature, uh, twist to this debate in arguing that there's a time inconsistency issue that potentially traps a central bank into accommodating the boom rather than leaning against it. A central bank that leans against the wind by tightening policy risks precipitating a bust and higher unemployment and so will be reluctant to act. But market participants will realize that the central bank will be thus inclined, in turn justifying the expectations of accommodative monetary policies and uh, thus pushing asset prices higher. And a dual mandate for the central bank 
which incorporates unemployment as well as inflation, would exacerbate this pressure not to act. Well, seen this way, the, the so-called Greenspan put was, an, was a, an inevitable equilibrium outcome rather than, a, rather than being a deliberate policy choice. Well, is there a way out of this box? I sense that Arthur believes that having an objective which clearly identifies the primacy of inflation helps. But even central banks that have lexicographic objectives, which puts inflation ahead of uh, other objectives, and that includes both the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and the Bank of England, cannot be indifferent to the consequences for activity of their policy choices. To me, the important thing is rather that the central bank has a sufficiently long horizon that it cares enough about the adverse consequences of a future bust for both activity and inflation, that it's willing to accept missing its objectives in the short run. Now, in addition, I think it helps if the central bank's monetary policy mandate explicitly recognizes the central bank's role in maintaining financial stability. Now, in the case of the United Kingdom, the remit for the Monetary Policy Committee now explicitly recognizes that financial stability considerations may justify a temporary deviation of inflation from the target. So it's another of those things in um, Arthur's list of caveats, I think he called them. Well, Arthur concludes by presenting some cross-country empirical evidence on the impact of inflation targeting uh, using a, a so-called differences in differences approach. Uh, unsurprisingly, inflation shows less persistence under inflation targeting. But one might expect that this would come at the expense of greater volatility and persistence in real variables. Uh, but Arthur finds that that's not the case and that the improvement in inflation performance is largely a free lunch. Well, that's consistent with the findings of several other empirical studies in the literature. Uh, and indeed, in the United Kingdom, the 15 years following the adoption of inflation targeting in 1992 were actually the most stable in a historical record going back almost 200 years. And this suggests that the adoption of inflation targeting represented uh, a shift to a point on the Taylor frontier, which, uh, remember, plots achievable output variance against inflation variance, from a point inside it rather than a movement along it. Uh, however, this is to ignore the experience of the past six years, which is pretty important experience, uh, during which we saw a very deep recession, and in this country, the slowest recovery on record. Well, I certainly don't agree with those who ascribe it primarily to the consequences of excessively loose monetary policies, the evidence suggests that was a marginal influence at best. Plenty of other factors were also relevant, including the development of complex securities, which were impossible to value in stress conditions, and which connected financial institutions in unexpected ways. The use of securitization vehicles to shift debts off balance sheet, and whose real aim was avoiding regulation. Pay packages for traders that encourage positions generating decent returns most of the time, but very high losses in a few states of the world, excessive reliance on credit rating agencies, defective risk management, and insufficient high quality capital to absorb losses. But macroeconomic conditions may nevertheless have played a part in a more subtle way. In particular, the long period of macroeconomic stability probably lulled people into a false sense of security, leading to an underestimation of risks and a build-up of excessive leverage. The success of inflation targeting and similar stability-oriented macroeconomic policies may to a degree, therefore, have carried with them the seeds of their own destruction. But the right response to this is not to say that inflation targeting is fatally flawed, Rather, we need to supplement monetary policy with the supervisory and regulatory policies 
capable of preserving financial stability. And with them in place, monetary policy can then be left free to focus on what it does best, namely controlling inflation. So I think New Zealand's gift to the world of central banking, inflation targeting, is going to be around for a long time yet, despite Jeff Frankel's quote that you mentioned at the start of your talk. So thank you very much, and thank you, Arthur. Does anyone want to respond on straight away before I throw the floor out? Well, one of, the, one of the issues I think that Charlie raises really usefully is the interaction of monetary policy with other parts of financial stability policy. Um, and I'll just go back a little bit in history again. In, in, 19, in the late 1980s, when we were rewriting the Reserve Bank Act, there was a desire at that stage um, by the Treasury to take the uh, financial stability actions, prudential supervision and all the other parts of central banking away and put them into an independent agency. The Reserve Bank right from that time regarded that central banking was a, was a whole, um, that you needed to do all these functions within the same institution because, because of the types of issues that, that Charlie just talked about. Um, you might need to use macroprudential policies on the banks, you may need to um, at least understand what the bank's balance sheets are doing and you, if you're supervising them you've got a much better chance of doing that. Um, and so we uh, insisted and in the end won the, won the fight to keep the entire gamut of central banking in one institution. I, I have to say I was very, um, in, in sort of devising the regime, I was very influenced by Charles Goodhart's book on the history of central banking, which shows that central banks essentially started as banks and therefore prudential supervisors of the banks that banks banked with them, and monetary policy was only a late, on, late clip on. You know, it sort of came along only after the demise of the gold standard. So essentially the heart of central banking was, um, was, the, was running the banking system, was making sure the banking system was sound, not the other way around. And many people forgot about that history and made mistakes, I believe, in, in divorcing parts of central banking. Now um, they're coming back together again as they've been together in New Zealand for the last 25 years. OK, if I can throw uh, open to the floor questions, comments. George. If people could say uh, their name, where they come from. Hi, uh, George Buckley from Deutsche Bank. Um, the, the current governor in the, of the Bank of England in the speech uh, towards the end of last year uh, entitled Guidance was um, talking about research which suggested uh, that guidance in the style of the RBNZ and the Riksbank and the Norges Bank where you tell us where you think interest rates are going to go was not associated with better outcomes for the economy. I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that and also whether that guidance, which I suppose is guidance for a sort of normal period of time rather than uh, what, what the sort of t time period we've seen over the past five years, whether that could have been an option for the Bank of England rather than the uh, unemployment thresholds that, uh, that uh, were chosen. Yeah, good question. Um, so as I said, we introduced forward guidance on interest rates in 1997. Um, and so every monetary policy statement that comes out every quarter since then has a forward track for, for interest rates, okay, for the next two years, where we expect short-term interest rates to go for the next two years. Um, and that's important in a way. You can't um, put out forecasts unless you say what the forecasts are based on. So just in terms of transparency, it's important. But also, um, actually just um, normalises the process of giving forward guidance rather than making a big thing out of it. Every quarter, you put out your expected interest rate track. Every quarter that's revised. Um, and so no one bats an eyelid the fact that you've changed your interest rate track from one quarter to the next. You, you'd be foolish not to because things have happened in the last quarter. Uh, so by making it just a normal part of policy, um, people, obviously people look at that very, very closely. They say, have you changed your view of the economy? Have the, you know, whatever the news that has come in over the last three months made, made you sort of think a bit differently? Um, and it's, um, you know, people just expect it. Now, whether it's um, led to a better or worse um, outcome, you can't tell because we don't know what the counterfactual would be. Um, and that's always the difficulty with these things, isn't it? But we, we sort of see it as much of a, a transparency issue. What, transparency has always been at the heart of our monetary policy since 1990. You need to make it absolutely clear what you think, what you're intending to do, what you're trying to achieve. And you, you put all, all that out. All our forecasts are public. Um, and uh, that's just to make sure that people don't see that you're trying to hide anything. Uh, so, to me, it, it just is a normal part of 
central banking, it makes a lot of sense. Now, I must say, I think it's easier to do with a single decision maker than with a with a committee model. Um, I, you know, obviously, the I'm not going to speak to the Monetary Policy Committee, but I could imagine some committees uh, elsewhere in the world would find it difficult to get to a consensus as to what the forward interest rate track would be. It'd be hard enough to agree what today's interest rate would never be, would, should be, never mind the next next two years. So, I think that's one advantage of the single single decision maker model. You can just wait for the uh, mic. Uh, thank you, uh, Tristan Carlyle from Central Banking Publications. Uh, to, just to follow up on that, uh, Professor Grimes, you mentioned earlier that the uh, idea of making the governor alone responsible for monetary policy boosted transparency and accountability. But I know there are some politicians in New Zealand that are trying to push towards uh, a committee membership uh, kind of style. Uh, I was just wondering what you would think the benefits and costs of that move would be. Yeah, I mean, typically we, we think committees make better decisions in, in many circumstances than a single decision maker. And, uh, you know, there's a large management literature on that. So it's a trade-off, basically. I think there's a trade-off between getting the sort of many minds, um, which a committee has, versus the clarity which a single decision maker has. Uh, and um, I remember being at a session in the American Economic Association one time um, where this was being discussed, and it, and, um, it turned out that people mischaracterised the New Zealand um, uh, situation. But it was their evidence was that a, a, a committee gave better decisions than a single decision maker. So you know, I think the jury's, jury's out on it. Um, what we do in New Zealand is that, in practice, it's a, it's a committee decision. Um, how do I say this? There, there's, a, there's a committee which has been variously called the Monetary Policy Committee or the Official Cash Rate, um, the Official Cash Rate Advisory Committee or whatever, that basically comes to a, a view um, and then they vote on it. But if the vote is 8-1 to do something but the one is the governor, then the governor does that. <laughs> okay, so it's just the governor's got more votes than everyone else put together. Um, but um, and uh, it's, like it's like. sort of like Cuba. Uh, <laughs> but um, but it actually works pretty well because it's a very open um, system. Everyone actually gets to say what they think should should be done. Now, the the interesting wrinkle on that is, as a board member, I don't take part in any decision making. Okay, I find out what the official cash rate. Is now I'll never find out, but you know I used to find out a minute after nine o'clock when, when the announcement was made. I'd, I'd see it on the Bloomberg screen or whatever at the same time as, as everyone else would, um, even as chairman of the bank. Um, but what we did see, we got the entire um, book that goes into um, the preparation of the monetary policy statement. We see everyone's individual recommendation. So in fact, the the, the committee, each individual person on the committee writes down a page of pros and cons of doing this or that and ultimately what their um, decision would have been if they were the governor. We see that as the, um, as the board so we can see whether the governor is at odds with his senior manager. Um, now that seems to me to be a really nice solution to this, to this problem. Um, the governor is held to account by the board. You know, if we saw as time after time the governor was being, you know, going against the advice of the senior management, well, it sort of, you know, would be um, a danger sign, obviously. Um, so I think that, that system works very well. Now, what, Graham Wheeler, since he became governor, has instituted much more of a governing committee of the four governors, um, which essentially, um, he's, and he's written a speech on this, so I'm not saying anything um, out, of the, out, of the, out of the way, um, which essentially is a consensus decision making by the four governors. But legally, the governor is still accountable. That to me is, is a nice situation. It's, um, uh, I think it was, um, you know, we're all equal, but some are more equal than others. Or if you're, adaptive, if you're one of the other people on the committee, it's power without responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, exactly, yeah. Interesting, I'll just say one little wrinkle on that. As a board, we see all the recommendations, as I said, the one pages, as well as all the other materials. We do not know which name goes with the, with the recommendation, and that's really important to avoid grandstanding. Oh. Uh, Jonathan Haskell, Imperial College. I enjoyed the lecture very much, Arthur. Can I ask you a little bit about what you were saying, if I understood it correctly, about the various exceptions that there are in the New Zealand setup for various supply shocks? Because as you know, one of the features of the UK, which I think has been a bit difficult, is inflation has been above target for quite a while. And people have talked about there being a series of kind of one-off supply shocks, which have caused yep. this kind of difficulty. 
Uh, now, obviously, in New Zealand, you know, with an earthquake and a natural disaster and all that kind of thing, you know, we're not, not talking about that, but it seems to me that if one were to draw the supply shocks net very wide, mm. then the bank would risk losing a bit of credibility yeah. because you'd get into the difficulty of, you know, potentially excluding everything. So have you reflected a little bit in New Zealand about, as it were, where the optimal point is to draw that? Is it drafted in a very specific way, in a very unspecific way, or what? It's a good, very good question. I'll see if I can... Um, Organise this so I go back to the graph of inflation. No, that didn't work, did it? Okay, let's. Uh, um, oh, here we go. Might be able to get it here. More slideshow. Uh, it's down on the right, the little. Oh, icon. is it? Okay, we should. Oh, well, that should really do it. No, it didn't. Um, okay. Oh, there we go. Right. So you'll you'll see there, Jonathan, that. From, you know, from 1990, once we got down to 1% of inflation or so, there's been these sort of jagged uplifts and very few jagged downlifts, to be honest. Um, the jagged downlift around 1999, by memory, was a precipitate fall in, in oil prices, uh, I think, which caused us to, um, uh, after probably a shock upwards, but um, to, 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 down, to undersh undershoot. And I remember un underlying CPI was certainly um, above above zero at that time. Now those other ones are a mixture of uh, a GST hike, um, so I think the sort of second to last peak there would be a, a GST hike or a VAT hike, um, which is explicitly allowed to be accommodated. Um, and uh, most of the other ones, uh, in fact probably all, all the other ones, pretty much are commodity price shocks, oil price shocks. Um, early on there was one or two other Oddity, odd ones, but there were commodity price shocks. So essentially, commodity price shocks, GST shocks, the Christchurch earthquake happened at a time of recession in any case, so it actually didn't turn out not to be inflationary then. Um, it is inflationary now because now we're going through a massive rebuild. I mean, the Christchurch earthquake, to, put a, to give you a feel for it, it's about, you know, sort of in terms of relation to the GDP, it's, you know, something like 5 or 10 percent, 5 or 10 times larger than the Japanese tidal wave and tsunami. Okay, I mean, that's sort of just a little, I was going to say drop in the ocean, that would be bad form, wouldn't it? Um, but it was, um, you know, that, the, the, the earthquake is just massive compared with, in terms of the size of the economy, compared with that. Uh, and it's now causing um, some real pressures, of, you know, the Reserve Bank is saying it's causing real pressures in the, in the building market, obviously, in the, you know. Um, so we, we've allowed that. Now, the, the point was that very, originally we had these very narrow caveats as I described them. Okay, it was um, GST increase, a commodity price shock, or a natural disaster. And they were the only, only three, essentially. Since then, we, we dropped that specificity as we got more credibility and um, instead managed to um, just say, you know, now it's 1% to 3% on average over the medium term because you can allow inflation to go up a bit or down a bit and get away with it because people believe that we're going to return to a 2% to midpoint. We couldn't have done that originally. You know, so we really had to buy that. Now, if we were too loose for too long, we'd lose that credibility and we'd have to go some, back to something very specific. So I think it's horses, of course, until you've built the credibility, I think you have to be very tight. Um, Thomas Lasky from the Financial Stability Department here at the Bank. Um, I was wondering what you thought about maybe some other possible nominal targets that don't seem to get covered that much. In particular, I'm thinking about nominal wages. Um, that appears to me to be to pass some of the, the tests that you apply to nominal GDP more timely, not revised, relevant to people. Um, it also appears to be possibly less susceptible to shocks. Uh, than inflation, so I was wondering where, where that's sort of fallen through the net. Interesting one. It's um, not one we ever considered closely. Um, so let me think about. Um, one of the. Uh, let me give you a political economy answer first, okay, before I give you an economics one. I've always viewed as a central banker the, the argument that what we're about is trying to control the cost of living, okay, stop the cost of living rising. That, to me, is, um, is what we're about, um, fundamentally. Uh, and I think it's something that can be sold. 
to the, to, you know, to the broad public. If you're a central bank and says our job is to stop wages growing, <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't like to be in the comms department of the, of the central bank that has that as their target. I think it would be an extraordinarily difficult one to sell. Um, probably in other ways it doesn't have the you know, same problems as, as nominal GDP, as, as you say. Um, but I don't think it has the salience that a CPI target would have. As I said, we, we, we've got in our um, policy targets agreement that we shall explicitly monitor other prices. And, 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 and we do explicitly put up you know, what's happening to wages, what's happening to house prices and all these sorts of things. Um, but I just wouldn't want to sell that as a target. I suppose the, the slightly tongue-in-cheek response to not allowing wages to go up is... Uh, that you wouldn't want to be a central bank and not letting prices go down because then you can buy more stuff. <laughs> Slightly tongue in cheek. <laughs> Luckily, people don't expect prices to come down <laughs> in aggregate anymore. But they once did, of course. But, and, yeah, but, yeah. It's an interesting thought. Okay. Charles Goodhart. Um, Arthur, going back to the history rather than the implications for the present. Um, there were two things I'd quite like you to expand on a bit more. The first one was the alternative treasury radical proposal to put New Zealand back to something very equivalent to the bank, 1844 Bank Act, which was quite extraordinary and that isn't widely known. And the other one was um, why the treasury actually stopped the suggestion of giving the governor a monetary incentive for hitting the target. Um, if you don't know that, I'll tell you. You do know. Okay, well, the first one, well, this is an interesting piece of history. Actually, we, I'm co-author of a book on the history of the Reserve Bank where we do go through this in, in some, some detail because no one ever read the book. It's not widely known, as, as Charles said. Um, the idea was to, to put a, a, a note, I can't even remember what it was called now, a note essentially a limit on the, on the um, M0, the notes and coins in circulation. And if the, um, with no other targets, and if the uh, central bank issued more notes and coins than what that target allowed, then the central bank would be declared bankrupt. That was their official words. And as a central bank, we said, well, wouldn't there be some sort of problems for the New Zealand's sort of you know, international image if the central bank was declared bankrupt? And they said, no, no, it's a very good thing. You know, it was all sort of great. But luckily, we had a minister of finance or an associate minister of finance who was running the process who actually understood that the nonsense of this, of this regime and put a stop to it. Uh, but it was an extraordinary sort of proposal for the, of the time. Um, now, the monetary incentive one, I know from our point of view, we, we didn't um, like it on the grounds that, especially at a time when we were still trying to get inflation down from high levels down to low levels, that um, the idea that the governor would be getting a bonus uh, at the time of reducing inflation, and inevitably after t t two decades of high inflation, um, we were going to cause a recession to get inflation down. There was no other way about doing it. But the idea of the governor getting a bonus at the time that unemployment was going to go up was, again, just not a sellable proposition. So that's my recollection of why we didn't do it. I'm not sure if you have another recollection, Charles. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I thought it was a treasury rather than the bank. I thought it was the treasury rather than the bank that took, that, that took the argument that you mustn't appear in public to be giving the people who take the decision on monetary policy a personal monetary mm. interest mm. in tightening policy with a result on unemployment. I thought that was a treasury position uh, rather than a bank. It was position. one that we shared as well. Mm. We, we shared that, yeah. Mm. I mean, uh, what these last two questions actually bring out is that a lot of central banking is about atmospherics um, as well as technique. It's really important. The political economy, and I think we don't teach this enough in, in universities, the political economy is at least as important as the economics. Um, and I was very fortunate to have people who actually understood that teaching me. Rob, and then Paul. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the, um, uh, the, the fact that an inflation targeter has got um, less of an incentive to burst a bubble than someone who's got a dual mandate. Um, I'm thinking if inflation's on target and you worry that a, 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 a bursting of the bubble will cause a recession which will cause inflation to go below target, I, I think the incentive is about the same. So could you explain why it's different? It's, it's the ex-post situation that you're in. 
that, that's, that's the thing. It's not the ex ante so much. So both a, a dual mandated central bank and a single mandated central bank might say, we're not going to accommodate this. Okay, we're not going to accommodate an asset price bubble. But only, but uh, uh, well, put it this way: a dual mandated central bank has much more difficult difficulty ex post in actually sticking with that line, because in the end, if they don't stick to that line, they'll end, they'll have to end, live with the unemployment. A single mandated central bank has a better chance um, ex post not to not to accommodate the bubble. And as I said in the talk, only a better chance because in the end we're all human. And as Charlie said, you know, we, we don't actually ignore these things entirely. But um, I think you've got a better chance of, of saying we will be tough. I mean, I think the inflation nutter has a better chance of saying I won't accommodate this, therefore you better not act in this way than somebody who's got an explicit dual mandate. You know, you both say the same things in advance. Okay. Paul? Paul Fisher from the, the bank and the MPC. As a relatively small open economy, I wonder if you could offer us any reflections on how you dealt with the exchange rate over this period, because I know New Zealand has had a number of exchange rate shocks. You've got a very large nearby trading partner whose policies must uh, feed back on you beyond just the uh, effect of commodity price shocks. Yeah, thanks. Actually, my second lecture is on exchange rate systems, so come along to that. Um, but I will say that, um, yeah, the exchange rate is our continual bugbear. To be honest, uh, um, it's very tough in a, in a world which is running accommodative monetary policies, especially now, um, to have an, an to have an interest rate that's a lot different. Because, you know, while we, we believe in, in in our economic theories that people are, are rational and expect, you know, interest rate differentials should reflect exchange rate expectations, they don't. You know, people do the carry trade. And if you've got a higher interest rate than everyone else, it's, it's problematic. You, have, you end up with, with, with a higher exchange rate. And that, and that does cause political economy problems as well as true economic problems as, as, as well. Um, it, is, it is difficult. I mean, we've probably had the cleanest float of any country um, since we floated in uh, 1985. There's been a couple of episodes of very minor intervention, but very minor. Um, and you know the exchange rate has ended up where it's ended up, uh, but it is it is problematic. Now, obviously, a high exchange rate does allow us to um, reduce inflation, you know, or forces inflation down by almost you know by directly through the traded goods price. Um, so, in those circumstances, one can then loosen interest rates a bit. Uh, we did have a little period, which was a mistake, of a monetary conditions index. We actually explicitly targeted a combination of the exchange rate and the short-term interest rate, and that lasted for about two years before it fell to bits in the Asian financial crisis. Um, but it, you know, the exchange rate is, is a real problem, to be honest. But come to my next lecture, and I'll give you more. <laughs> I think I think that's probably a, a, a good point to finish because we're supposed to finish at uh, 25 past. Um, and can I suggest that the two remaining questions we pick up uh, during the refreshments downstairs? Thank you, Charlie. I'm, my closing responsibility is to thank both Charlie and particularly Arthur for their presentations this evening. It's also to thank you for being with us. An occasion like this needs an informed audience, and it's great that we have one. We have um, also some refreshments to see you on your way back to your various abodes. Where will it be? Uh, down below. It's down below. So join me in thanking both our speakers, and join us for a little...